women in this world were lied to when they were told you can have it all. There's no such thing. There's always a price to pay and there's always going to be, something has to give. So if you want the career and you want a PhD and you want to be a boss babe and you want to have all of those things, it's your choice, it's your life. But just be aware that there are women who came before you who were told the same thing and you can find them on TikTok crying about the fact that it's not true. And they thought that at 35 and 38, they would find a nice 38 year old man, a 40, ma 40 year old man to marry them and have a family and all of that kind of thing. Cause they still wanted that. And then they find that, oh, there's no men because all the men married earlier or they married younger than them and they can still do that. I don't want our sisters to, to get fooled like they got fooled. I want us to, to be smarter than that so that we don't end up giving up something that maybe was actually really important to you because you thought you could have it all. That's all I'm saying. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to the realest podcast in the dunya, The Three Muslims. We're joined here with a very special guest, Sister Naima. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, how is it going? Alhamdulillah. All good, mashallah. All good. We're grateful for every blessing, alhamdulillah, all the way. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So, I've heard uh, your TikTok famous now. Apparently so, yeah. And after um, about mm, 10, 15 years online, it's about time. It's about time. It was coming. It was coming? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, the mob, quote unquote, is coming for you, right? Um, I think there were um, a, a couple of things that I said that people didn't like. Um, I think maybe the things I said, the way that I said them, uh, mm. The language I used and the tone was something that was unfamiliar to my usual audience. Um, and I'm going to be honest, uh, you know, at this point and say that I have changed in certain respects when it comes to the way that I see, especially male-female dy dynamics. And that I can't deny that. If you watch some of my videos from 2019, for example, I said things there that were you know, what my sisters needed to hear at the time, I felt, uh, and what I believed. Um, but the thing is that a lot of the time within the community, we live in echo chambers, and we, we, we are in our own bubble. So you can be in a bubble of people who all believe like you do, see the world that you do, and they love what you're saying, you know, that it, it, it fits in with what they want to see, how they want to see the world. But the problem is when you come out of that bubble, if you come out of that chamber and you start to look at things from another's point of view, in this case for me, starting to actually listen to men and hear what men have to say about these things, what men's experiences are, you can't go back into that bubble again. You can't go back into that bubble. You can't unknow what you now know. Right. It's just like a brother who's grown up talking to brothers his whole life. He's never really, really listened to sisters. Mm. Once, you know, when men are together, they speak a certain way. When sisters are together, women are together. We talk a particular way. Now, if that brother is privy to certain conversations where women are being very honest, very open and telling their stories, he can't go back now to that brother's space and talk the way that he used to because he's seen the other side of it. And that's been my journey. That's why I'm here now speaking the way that I speak and saying some of the things that I say that are uncomfortable and that are, are not what people want to hear, but it's the truth, you know, it's the reality. So this is, this is, this is the interesting thing. So I see that certain people obviously see that shift. Uh, it's an uncomfortable thing for them. It's, mm. it's actually a scary thing for them. Some people say like, I don't know who you are anymore. I feel like I can't trust you anymore. And I'm like, sis, it's okay. Like, I've got a few more years in this dunya than you, and I've been through a bit more than you. And if I'm saying this stuff to you and to my sisters, it's nothing more than I say to myself and my friends. I'm not out here pointing fingers at anybody. I'm here looking in the mirror 
from a place of honesty and vulnerability and trying to be real and keep it real and keep it 100. If you don't like that, mm. well, block and delete. It's very easy. Unfollow. It's not a big deal. Hmm. I think that's the issue with cancel culture today. You say anything that goes against mainstream media status quo and you're automatically a villain. So what are some of these so-called things that you're talking about that you've you've heard the voices of men? You've begun to unplug. I hate to use that word, but unplug from the, the whole matrix, the whole gynocracy. Like, what are you noticing now? What new things have you learned? Well, I always knew um, instinctively that we have our own lived realities. Every single one of us does as individuals. And of course, as men and women, especially, especially in the Muslim community, we do live in almost different worlds. And then on top of that, our biology, you know, the way we're acculturated, the way that we, we've been brought up means that we have differing viewpoints. I would say that coming from the space that I've come from, which is a very, very female space, alhamdulillah, obviously, you know, all my friends are, are women. Uh, I ran Sisters Magazine for 10 years. I've been working with and supporting women for the past 20 years. So obviously it's a very female space. What happens in that space is that you start to believe women's versions of everything. So the way that we see the mm. world becomes the truth. Uh, and because up until very recently, I would say, Muslim men have not been speaking, we never heard the brother's side. And I don't mean Muslim men have not been talking. No, they've been talking because the imam is a is male, the, the scholars are male, the du'at are male, most TV presenters are male. So I'm not talking about preaching Islam. I'm not talking about, you know, men kind of saying things. I'm talking about men actually speaking about their own experiences and their personal opinions and their personal experiences. We haven't had spaces like that, really, until very recently. Um, and now you're seeing spaces where men, Muslim and non-Muslim, are coming together and speaking their lived experience. And when you, well, like I said, when you go into those spaces and you hear those conversations, you start to see that, hold on a minute, it's not just one victim here. There isn't, it's not always the sister who's the victim and the brother who's the perpetrator, which is the version of the world that many of us sisters do live in, right? And maybe for brothers, it's the same. Maybe brothers also think, oh, the sisters are always like just, you know, making noise about something and then we have to suffer for whatever. But again, us being stuck in those polar positions is damaging for us as individuals. And I believe it's damaging for us as a community. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm glad to be able to be in spaces where we as brothers and sisters can actually have honest respectful conversations where we, we all have the same goal at the end of the day you know we're not about to have a battle of the sexes within the ummah it's not acceptable because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already shown us that we need each other okay our relationship is a symbiotic relationship and we will never succeed if either one of us is failing and that's a fact we need each other so anything that is kind of making us not speak to each other or look at each other through a lens that is overwhelmingly negative, anything from either side, that needs to be combated, it needs to be dealt with. And of course, I'm sure we're gonna talk about red pill and feminism later, but it's interesting you know, that these conversations are now happening within the Muslim community where you would think we wouldn't need to have those conversations because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made everything clear. But as I'm sure we'll mm. get into it as we get into it it's not as black and white as that. You know, our community is impacted by the outside environment much more than we like to admit. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, there has been this huge dichotomy uh, between men and women. And it's not something that's inherently uh, Islamic at all. It, it's something that is inherently, I would say, uh, Western. It's hmm. this Western lifestyle that you know propagated this feminism and then in turn propagated this red pill movement and it, it, if you look at the similarities between someone who follows something like red pill and, and, and a woman who follows something like feminism a lot of the time it stems from the same place that they went through some kind of hurt they're looking for a sense of belonging and protection and then they go to this this movement that gives them that sense of you know i'm being heard listened to and empowered but subhanallah it's, it's really unfortunate that they're just continuing that dichotomy because red pills for men, feminism's for women. And it's like 
there's there's no benefit there. So uh, there's there's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, benefit, alhamdulillah, from having these uh, intersex mm -hmm. you know, dialogues and discussions so that people can hear the other side. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, we were talking about you know, blowing up on TikTok and all that, and not for the right reasons, um, according to you know those people. But uh, that's something I went through recently. And uh, although a lot of the time I was a bit like, you know, these people are taking it way too far, slander, this, that, the other. Um, I did hear a lot of the sisters out and that completely changed my perspective on it as oh, well. So I really yeah. resonate with what you're saying with, you know, speaking to the opposite side and, and seeing, you know, where they're coming from. Because every everyone's, you know, the good guy on their side, respectively. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, mm. yeah it's true. Yeah, so let's let's get into it. What were some of the things that you feel that you talked about, you discussed that a lot of people were uncomfortable with? I would say the biggest deal was what I said about women who are past a certain age and have had a certain relationship history, understanding where they fit in as far as men are concerned in general. Now, let's be clear, okay? Every one of us has some baseline requirements and then we have nice to haves okay we have different personalities we want a different personality in our partner we want different versions of the relationship you know if you ask every single one of you to describe your perfect relationship you're not all going to say the same thing because you all have your own individual personality right however the important thing and, and one of the things i would like to stress is in general we like to be told things that make us feel good, okay? And if I say to a sister, and I, and I say this to my friends, and I have said this to myself, I am not 22. I am not a 22-year-old, fresh graduate, never had a child, never done any, any of that living anymore. I'm not. It's okay, all right? I'm in my 40s, bruv. Don't think that I, you know, that I am what people who would like to start a family, okay, would like to start from scratch with a wife who's going to grow with them and, and have his children, they have children together and they build their life like I was when I first got married, okay. I'm not that woman anymore. That's a reality. It's okay to accept reality. I said to a friend of mine, you see, we are in the same position now as Muslim women as non-Muslim women are when they get to a certain stage in life and they want to get married. The difference is a lot of us have already been married, whereas they maybe had like a whole phase and all that kind of thing. We didn't do that. But many of us, I have plenty of sisters who are like around my age, a little bit younger, who, uh, you know, may have had a marriage or two, have had children. They would like to find someone. OK, but now they're in their late 30s. 40s, divorced a couple of times, don't really want to have any more children. Physically, at the end of the day, <laughs> late 30s, early 40s, you're, you're on your, you know, your, your peak of uh, fertility is gone, okay? Maybe even your peak of health might be gone if you haven't looked mm. after yourself very well. Not only that, but emotionally and mentally, you are not the same. If you've been through a divorce or two, you have been through some kind of trauma a lot of the time. OK, even if it was an amicable divorce, divorce, guys, just just because it's an amicable divorce does not mean that there is not pain that you may have resolved or you may not have resolved. And that's why you find a lot of sisters who kind of come out of the situation and they're in that space of life. Their list is really long because they know they don't want this. They don't want that anymore. They're not going to do this again. They're not having that. They're not doing this. They're not having that. They're not doing this. Not only are they not doing this, but they also now want uh, he has to support me financially. He needs to be, you know, I need to be sexually attracted to him. Uh, you know, he needs to have good dean. I want him to be a stepdad to my kids and a father figure. Um, and, and then whatever race may be, uh, physical attributes may be. He needs to like reading. He needs to like going on long walks. What, what, all this stuff, right? My message is, sis, the pool is smaller where we are, Okay. We have to be realistic. It's not a fairy tale. In fact, one of the TikToks was making fun of the fact that I said it's not a fairy tale, sis. <laughs> it's not a fairy tale. If you want fairy tales, Netflix and chill by yourself because that's where the fairy tales are, okay? 
in the songs, in the movies, in the TV, that's the fairy tale that there's some perfect guy out there waiting for you to scoop up your 35 old behind and your three children. He, the ideal guy is there somewhere. <laughs> I'm like, says who, who said that? Who promised you an ideal man? Did Allah say that? Does, and in fact, a sister said, actually, uh, she, they've left a message on my Instagram and she said, older and divorced women deserve the same rights as X, Y, Z. And I thought that was so interesting because who is to say who deserves what? Can any of us say we deserve anything more than I think fair treatment maybe, you know, a decent person? But can you say you deserve X, Y, Z? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives and takes? I, I don't get it. But anyway, al-muhim, the thing that I said was, sometimes you may, and the thing is, there are lots of things that make a partner more desirable or less desirable in the marketplace, which is another thing that I got slated for using the word marketplace <laughs> as if we are objects to be bought and sold. I said, you've got issues, sis. You've got issues. If you hear me use the word marketplace and you feel objectified, I'm sorry, but I'm not taking that. I'm not going to carry the burden of your understanding of my language. Have you not been on Muzmatch before? You're not seeing how those things work? Swipe left and swipe right? Mm. That's not a marketplace to you? That's not Amazon.com to you? Of course it is. Because all we're doing is literally judging a book by its cover more times than not and looking for certain maybe red flags or certain things that, oh, he's working. What's the job? Accountant. Okay, yeah, I'll swipe right. So that's, that's shopping. That's what you guys are doing at the end of the day. When we, nowadays, this, this again, guys, I'm going to be calm. <laughs> it's not ideal. Hmm. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. And the sooner you understand what it is, the sooner you can start winning in the space of what is real versus what is ideal because the ideal doesn't exist especially not for people you know we've talked to you know brothers i was a sister was saying a sister who's older maybe she's older she's been married she, whatever all of these things that men seem to consider important somehow i'm not sure why that is many people are, are upset about the fact that men care that they're older or that men care that they've been divorced why should you care oh i feel like that shouldn't matter but it's not for us to feel like it shouldn't matter that's not our mm. business because again, I'm going to use market language. There's a supply and there's a demand. Yes or no? Yeah, it's a buyer's market it's, too. It's not romantic, guys. It's not Hollywood. It's not Disney. It's not Mushar Fa'i. It's literally people making choices about who they are going to invest their time and their effort and resources in. And, you know, doing it for reasons that they hope are the right reasons. Okay, so going back to what I was saying. You know, you've got this, 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 this marketplace and, um, you know, where people are kind of making these choices and trying to find somebody. Most of the time, people are not falling in love at first sight. It's not your magnetic personality. OK, it's not your kindness. It's not your generosity that is going to pull that person to you because of the way that we even finding each other. Is it ideal? No. Because in an ideal world, we would hardly see the outside things. We would see directly to the heart. Is this person a good person? Do they have Iman? Are they kind? Are they generous? Do they care about others? Are they committed? These things, these matters of character of the heart, in an ideal world, that's all we would care about. In an ideal world, we'd be able to see those things straight away. Do we live in an ideal world? No, we do not. We live in a world where we have lots of other things that, you know, that we are you know, trying to take into account and also things that we're using to make choices. So what I wanted to say was men, many men, I'm not going to say all men, but many men have certain preferences for their woman, the woman that they want to start a family with. Sis, it's not for us to say whether those preferences are correct or not. Mm -hmm. It's not. Because at the end of the day, you're not the one choosing. He's the one who's looking for what he wants. So you can't shame him into not wanting that. I, I don't think that that's fair because we sisters don't get shamed per se for what we want, even though sometimes what we want is way like 
beyond what is even reasonable, which is in line with women in general. Yeah, this is not a Muslim woman thing. This is women in general. Women in general are the ones who have those long, long, long lists and all the different things that disqualify someone from dating, etc. It's just women in general. But my point is this, just as we, you know, if a brother has got no money and has no prospects, no one cares about his heart. No one cares about his character, really. A lot of the time, it's like, oh, you're not going to provide for me? Okay, khalas. You know, and, and even for, for, you know, a brother, in, there could be many things. Money could be one of them. He could be aesthetically not top of the range. He could be overweight. He could have a disability. He could be living with his parents and not intending to move. All of these things make him less desirable, right? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. According to what sisters are generally looking for. So it's okay to acknowledge that there are preferences at play. Now, your decision is, am I going to pay attention to the preferences? Am I going to prioritize me finding a spouse? Or am I going to prioritize my list? And no one's shaming you mm. either way. If you want your list, keep your list. But understand that it may stop you from achieving your objective if it is to find a spouse. And if your objective is to find a spouse, you may want to look at that list with a more critical eye and ask yourself, do I qualify for this person, this perfect person? Because just like people said, another thing that people didn't like is that I said that people should be realistic. They said, I'm telling sisters to settle. Let me tell you something. Any one of us chooses any one of us we're going to be settling. Why? Because it's very rare to find someone who fits everything on your list. That is a fact. And the more traits you have that make you less desirable, the more that brother is settling for you. Do you think that, I mean, say he marries you. He's happy to marry you, mashallah. He likes you, you know, he's attracted to you, he thinks you're a good person and he's ready to commit to you. But you have five children. Don't you think that there was a thought process in his head to say, you know what, it would have been better if she didn't have five kids, but alhamdulillah, it's worth it. Yes or no? Oh, but, but, but we never say that the brother is settling because settling is something women do and women should have to settle. So, okay, don't settle. If you think you're all that, stay, be bad and stay like that <laughs> because that attitude, even the attitude of, I won't settle. I deserve the best. I deserve this and this and this. It's an entitled attitude that has no basis. And I would rather that sisters have, again, sorry to go on about this, but I think sisters heard something that I didn't say in that mm -hmm. your value to a husband is somehow indicative of your value as a person. And that is not true because every single one of us has intrinsic value as a human being and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single one of us has value. No matter your age, your race, your you know, marital history, physically, whatever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at our hearts. He looks at our iman. That is never in question. But when you're looking to get married, your value, it's not about your value as a human being. It's not about how valuable you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is how valuable you are to this man or this woman. And that is their perception that will determine how valuable mm -hmm. you are. So someone will choose you in spite of certain things that they don't like because they consider you to be of value, enough value for them to invest in you. This is male and female. It's okay for us to acknowledge these realities. I think it's, it's an ideal versus real type of uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I feel is happening here. Yeah, Ladies, I think Sister Naima is basically saying the same thing that I've said, but you know, after, after getting canceled all these times, when I keep saying high value man or woman, I'm not talking about in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm talking about in the marketplace. Hate mm. to use these terms, but I'm I'm saying it as it is. All right. This isn't, you know, and then we talk about education, should women chase careers and all this. And they're like, oh, what do you mean? The all this hobby, they were educated, they knew the deen. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about these useless anthropology degrees and stuff like that. But don't hate you know. on anthropology degrees. I wanted to take an anthropology degree. <laughs> anthropology is lit, man. What? But the point is, you're right. Is it's if you want to take an anthropology degree. But don't mm. think that it makes you more valuable as a wife and mother, because Too that's many. not necessarily the case. Again, it's the value, isn't it? So maybe if you go for a job as a university lecturer, your anthropology degree counts. Mm. 
Maybe mm -hmm. if you're speaking to a brother who wants to start a family, your anthropology degree may not count or it may even be a step down because he's thinking, eh, is she going to be happy with being at home? That's I want, you know, do you understand? Like, and this is the other thing as well. And I think I mentioned this on a different conversation is that we as women, this generation and the one that's coming up and the one that's coming up afterwards, we've been taught to value certain things about us, which you could say are, have traditionally been masculine pursuits, okay? Mm. Success academically, success in the workplace, money, okay? Property, uh, you know, the, the coin, okay? Traditionally, very masculine concerns, very mm. masculine pursuits. Traditionally, again, no shame. I have a business of my own, whatever. It is what it is. But the point is, we value those things about ourselves. We're proud of those things. Society has taught us to be proud of them. And we've put in a lot of work. We've put in a lot of time and effort and resources, et cetera, into becoming that person. So it's almost a slap in the face when you speak to somebody for the potential prospect of marriage. He doesn't rate it like that. Mm. He's not impressed. He's not impressed. He wants to know, can you cook though? Can you clean? And the real, the real sting is that we look down on cooking and cleaning and raising children because we've been fed on the feminist Kool-Aid. And I'm going to say it, guys. And I'm going to say it because I felt it myself. I'm not here pointing fingers. Like I said, I'm here looking in the mirror. So I've had those situations where somebody has you know, been considering me for marriage and I tell them what I do. And their response is, but how does that affect you in the home? <laughs> I tell you, I got triggered so bad. I was triggered because I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, you're supposed to be impressed by what I do. You're supposed to think this, this is an amazing woman. Yeah, definitely want to be on her program. No, that's not what he's looking for. He is thinking to himself, okay, this is cool. Mashallah, nice. But does that mean that I'm going to now have less of her? Does it mean that she's going to want to argue with me? Does it mean that we're going to be fighting for like who leads and, you know, who understands more and whose decision gets to, do you understand? That's what he's thinking. It's unfortunate, ladies. But I do believe it's the truth. Brothers, you're all here. Please tell me that I'm talking utter nonsense if I'm talking utter nonsense. But this has been my experience. Yeah, yeah. Just to, um, just to give my own perspective on that. As, as a Muslim man, I believe personally what a woman makes is completely inconsequential. And the reason I say that is because yeah. as, a, as a man, I'm obligated to, to provide. Yeah. So whether yeah. she makes money or not, it doesn't matter because she, she's not going to be spending. Like my, my wife's money is her money and like yeah. it doesn't matter. So whether she has this, that, the other, it doesn't matter. But what I personally find, um, uh, well, frankly, attractive is, is motherhood. A, a woman, mm. who I, and, mm. and I say this is going to be a good mother. Maybe it's yeah. a something a lot put in our fitrah as men that's something that i'm 100 percent inclined towards bro i agree with that but women psychologically can't turn off that ceo muscle and turn on housewife muscle it just it doesn't work in the real world that's just my personal objective or subjective findings yeah, yeah it's well, something that she gonna, definitely wants to do no but she needs to want to do it i think i would say it's not impossible but mm -hmm. she needs to want to do that because we can always change as human beings. I believe mm -hmm. that, you know, this, this is something we can control. And if a woman wants to change, she can. It's been done many, many mm -hmm. times before. However, you can't turn a CEO into a housewife against her will. That's not going to happen mm -hmm. because it's, and again, I, I want to, I want to just, just make this point again, because I want the sisters in the back to hear it. When, if, and when, a man asks you about cooking or cleaning or looking after the home or your vision for your family and your children, okay? The wife role, the mother role, if you feel in any way insulted by that or you feel it's a red flag or you feel that, you know, he's kind of downgrading you, check yourself because that is definitely part of the programming. Feminism did what it did but it did not do whatever it did for femininity. If anything, it encouraged us to be masculine. And which is crazy because that assumes that masculinity is the model. Masculinity is the superior model and women should be allowed to be masculine like that. Of course, men are not allowed to be masculine anymore. We don't want that because that's toxic, can't have that. 
But women, yes, boss girl, all of all of that stuff that you see out there that unfortunately some of our young women are also jumping on the bandwagon of, see it for what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described our roles very clearly, guys. Like there is no, you can maybe talk about red pill, whatever. I remember somebody saying that Islam is red pilled. I said, D if you compare Islam to what so-called red pill manosphere, trad cons, et cetera, see as the traditional roles, Islam is that because it's traditional. Islam is inherently traditional when it comes to gender roles. That may sting. You may hate to hear it, but it's true. Are those roles rigid? Are they as oppressive as we've seen? No. The seerah shows us that. But in general, the gender roles that Islam, that we've been taught in Islam, are the traditional roles that you see in almost every single society throughout mm -hmm. the history of the world and through everywhere, right? So again, if you feel that being a mother or a wife is a downgrade, to check yourself, because it could be that there is something in your heart there that is not at ease with being a woman in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, or is not at ease with your femininity and that you're fighting with this, this idea or this notion, and which means you probably don't really want to be a wife in the traditional sense. I think some women talk about wanting to get married, not because they want to be someone's wife, but because they want company. You know, they want a companion. They don't want to be lonely anymore. It's not quite the same as being a wife, I'm afraid. You know, a wife has a job just like a husband has a job. If someone is your man, he might not necessarily be your husband because a husband has certain responsibilities. Similarly, a wife has certain responsibilities. And if we're not prepared to take on those responsibilities, then we have to really ask ourselves, you know, am I actually wife material? Like no mm -hmm. cap. Am I wife material? If you look in the mirror and you say, would I marry me? Not would I hook up with me? Not would I like me? Not would I have a thing for me? No, would I marry me? Would I commit to myself? Would I cleave to myself and pour my resources, my time, my energy, my seed into me and entrust all of that in me? Can I do that? Am I up mm. to the task? What does it even mean to be a wife anyway? Is it basically me, I just show up and I'm the halal whatever? Is that what being a wife is? Because unfortunately from what I'm hearing, and again, this is anecdotal, but the word on the street is, if you do press sisters to say, what do you bring to the table? I, we've got sisters out here saying, I don't cook. I don't like cooking. I don't like cleaning. I've got debts. Um, you know, I, my kids, like, I'm kind of struggling with them, whatever. Uh, you know, I don't really want to live with someone or I don't want you to come into my house or I don't want to move into your house. And, you know, and I'm working on my this and I'm working on my that. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you bring it and you boil it all the way down, you've got some sisters who really, when you ask them, okay, go, okay, okay, stop capping now. What do you bring to the table? She'll be like, well, it's a halal thing, isn't it? And it's like, that's not a wife. A halal thing is not a wife. A wife is there's there's a job description do you mm. qualify for that job description are you prepared to do the job if you're not prepared to do the job get honest with yourself and make a decision you either want the job or you don't if you want the job start acting like it start talking like it and start preparing for it otherwise you don't have anything to complain about because us one is not really what you want you say you want to be a wife but in your heart it's like no, i don't want to do that no, I want to go for romantic dinners and brunches. That's what I want to do. I want the cool mm -hmm. stuff. That's what I want. Yeah. I want to hear what Anha has to say about that because just like yourself, Anha is also a revert. He reverted about a year ago. So oh, I want to hear if uh, what, you're, what you hear right now, it aligns with what you felt most of your life, but also what you're learning now about Muslim women. Say bismillah, bro. What are you doing? Yo, it's in my head, man. Stuff. Hey, I like that. I, like that. I think there's another thing too it's it's the perseverance aspect too like we're more willing to stick through with things that we set out with an intention it's impossible to have empathy for others if you're not patient so my love bless you for that first of all i agree with the fact that the whole thing you said about friends where it's like if, if they're affecting you more than you're affecting them then you should probably get some new friends you want to be investing stocks shares bonds you want to be investing in crypto because there's this thing called inflation which means every year that passes by, the value of a dollar goes lower and lower and lower. 
And the reason being is because they're printing more money, right? That's why money is haram. At least this, the paper money is haram. Provided that you're actually there and you're being a good father and the mother's being a good mother, best conditions. And behind the mic, Hamza, Andreas, Zortzis, we will go in with our final three with brother Angel, inshallah. It's not just a responsibility on you, it's a responsibility on all the children, especially your father. In our private area is very elastic. And yeah, if you go too fast, the skin will literally crease up into like the edge of like the little clipper things, and you will literally clip your skin. You don't want to be on YouTube or the internet or anything that that amount of time, but it's it's the the fact is that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I want to say this is a breath, a breath of fresh air. This is like a one out of 10 type woman who's going to say these things. I'm just being honest with you. Not trying to hype you up. Not trying to pedestalize you or anything. We but don't the do the pedestals, remember? Yeah, we, we don't, don't do, do pedestals. We don't, we don't, do, that. We don't <laughs> do that here. Listen, we don't do that. But um, I want to touch on two points. All right. So number one, when you were talking about women getting degrees and then having businesses and stuff like that and then thinking that that adds inherent value to them as a woman as a, a candidate to be a wife i think it depends right that's a loaded question in the sense where it's like ask them why they're doing it. Mm. like why did they get that degree why are they in that profession why do they have this business if the if the answer is because they needed to basically provide for themselves or make money all right, it doesn't add any value. But if a woman tells me like, oh, I'm very passionate about designing or, or about, um, mm. I don't know, how that's wrong. You, you understand what I'm saying? If she's passionate about this thing and it's not about the money, but she, there's real passion there to where she's doing good work and it's, it's like, it's almost feminine. You know, like when I see that, I was like, oh, that's, that's very feminine. You know, like she's not worried too much about providing for herself. She's just worried about like, Okay, am I doing something good? Like, am I am I passionate? Mm. Is there emotion here? Is mm. is there you know you you get it. is there passion? You know, so I guess it's a loaded question and it depends. Right? Mm. Yeah, it depends for a I man agree. if they're if they're looking and then like if me personally that's that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. And for the other thing, when you said for a woman to ask herself the question, it could be the same for men. One hundred percent. Ask themselves the question. Am I spouse material? Like, would I be with myself for this, mm. this, and that? Um, and and oh, would I trust myself? Would all this stuff, right? Again, that's a loaded question because think about how egotistical everyone is. Mm. Like, come on, we look at ourselves in the mirror and we just look and we're like, ooh, mashallah. Like, not everyone though unfortunately some of us look in the mirror and we just shake our heads and we're like oh no no no, no. <laughs> yeah, listen, it's true no, i know it's true. i know i feel himself right there listen 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 no i'm not trying to get to that i'm I'm saying that like whether it's our appearance whether it's our behavior whether it's our personality whether it's our profession the amount of money we're bringing in something like that we always try to see ourselves like even if we are our own worst critic we also are the person who sees ourselves in the best light. So mm -hmm. with that question, it's more so like the person has to really humble themselves and just ask like the genuine question and really just respond authentically, as authentically as possible yeah. in order to see, okay, am I, am I actually a proper candidate? Mm -hmm. Or am I just trying to fool myself? I love that you mentioned humble because this is this is an interesting dichotomy because a sister messaged me and she said, like, how dare you tell sisters of a certain bracket that they should, you know, kind of be realistic with their expectations. Don't you know sisters already have low self-esteem and are already like settling for less than they deserve? OK, and I want to speak to that because as we're having these conversations, we have to understand that the human experience is so multifaceted. And there is no way we can ever say Muslim men this, Muslim women that, uh, you know, virgins, single mothers, divorcees, X, Y, Z. We, we can't do that because everyone's experience is different. However, 
to your point about being humble, um, when I did my video about, you know, single, single Muslim women, do you really need a man, right? Um, the big thrust of that video was speaking to that woman who maybe has been through a marriage, it didn't work, she would like to find love again, she wants to have a family, because hey, being a single parent, period, yeah, not just mum, but being a single parent is tough, okay, so she's, she's lonely, she's stretched, she's all these things, and she's looking for somebody online or wherever the case may be, and my thing was, and it still is, do the work on yourself first before you go out there, because there are no saviors out there. I don't believe there are people who are equipped to save us from ourselves. If my life is a mess and I'm online swiping left and right, trying to find someone to come and fix it and sweep it up for me, I am going to fall victim to people who feed on my insecurity, who feed on my weakness, on my low self-esteem and my, you know, my sense of unworthiness. That's not what I want for anyone, man or woman. So every one of us has the responsibility to get ourselves in order first. Again, it's that conversation in the mirror, right? Where you're saying, you know, would I with myself? Would I commit to myself? Would I invest in myself? And be honest. And if the answer is no, understand that you have the wherewithal to fix it yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you in this situation. He can get you through it. But sometimes you'll have to find strength from places that you didn't know before. And I, and I will still say that we don't preach emotional resilience and self-reliance enough to sisters. When you hear people talking on the pulpit or the mimba, they often will talk about sisters who are vulnerable, divorcees, widows, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. And they'll say, it's for the men of the community to stand up. I remember when I was in Nigeria, there was a, a Q&A session after one of the big conferences. Mufti Mank was there and some other people. And uh, I was the only speaker, only female speaker, but they had me on stage as well. And someone asked a question about, I think it was widows or single mothers, right? Because there's a lot of divorce happening everywhere, right? And, and most of the time, the children end up staying with the mother, except in some instances where the father sends the mother, the wife, away and he keeps the kids. Anyway, when they answered the question initially, they brought the theory the theory is what? The theory is that no woman left behind, right? The mm. theory is no sister left behind because she has a mahram. She has a father. She has an uncle. She has a brother. She should have men in the community who are prepared to look after her and make sure that she doesn't struggle, make sure that she doesn't have to fend for herself. This is the theory. It's the ideal. But again, I ask, is that the reality? It's not the reality. And that was when I spoke up, I said, this sounds really good, but that's not what's happening on the ground. What's happening on the ground is that women are being left with the responsibility of these children, many fathers no longer involved after the divorce. Mm. There is no village. There is no community. Okay, people who are stretched and struggling, especially in the West, you don't have your father paying your bills. Who does that? Who has, you know, if, if, the, if her husband is no longer there, whose father is stepping in and saying, you know, come home, come home with the children, you know, mm. where they'll be raised with the grandfather and the grandmother. And who does that? You know, the, the, the brother, is he going to give you a monthly stipend from his salary? His wife's going to have a problem with that because she's like, why doesn't she have a husband? Like, you know, why doesn't she sort herself out? So my point mm. is this, is the reality for me, this is just my opinion. May Allah forgive me if I'm wrong, but telling those women who are in a vulnerable situation that they need to be even more reliant on a man from somewhere means that when they go into the dating marketplace, they are vulnerable because they, their lives are in a mess and they don't believe they can sort it out unless there is a man. But let me tell you one thing. When that man comes in, you've got another set of problems, sis, because he didn't come in to save you. He came in <laughs> to get his needs taken care of. No, I'm sorry. There's, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't demonize either. We're all just human beings at the end of the day. But I remember one sister, uh, we were having a, a gathering for reverts, and she was talking about you know, the, this pressure on reverts to get married quite quickly, especially revert women, to marry someone quickly so that they can be absorbed into the Muslim family and, 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 and you know, hopefully become more established in her Islam, right? And 
I said, and, and this particular sister had a lot of like mental issues and she was very lonely and she was really struggling and everything. And I said to her, sis, my advice to you is learn your deen, strengthen your iman and get happy. Then look for a husband because guess what? Most men are not therapists. Most men are not counselors. Most men do not have the toolkit needed to sort you and your mental, emotional, and spiritual and physical state out. And putting that on him is unfair. Especially someone you met from online. And that's why a lot of brothers, I, I noticed that brothers who have been looking for a while, they become jaded. Because they're like, every sister's got a sob story. Every sister that I've spoken to, all she's talking about is the brother that did her wrong and this one who left her and this one who did that. I'm sorry, sis. I'm so sorry. And I, I'm saying this, wallahi Allah knows, from a place of love. If that is your relationship history, you have to heal. You can't be out here speaking to a potential partner and basically reeling off a disastrous history of abuse and toxicity and wounding and, and, and attachment and did it, all of these things because who wants to sign up for that? And the one who does want to sign up for that, even for me, is more of a red flag. Because as a man, why are you doing that? Like, like no, 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 no. Because if you told your friends, yeah, bro, like, you know, she's got depression and, you know, she's been divorced three times and she's got, you know, four baby daddies and da, 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 da yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm thinking it could be good still. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. You, you, you've got, you've seen something else here. You know, there's, there's, there's a vulnerability that you've tapped into for whatever weird reason you think, yeah, I can get what I need out of this. It's not a healthy place to be. Okay. And that is my thing is that let's get healthy. See, this this begs a, a really important question to me because I know you have sons, right? So yes. I wonder what type of game do you put your sons on? What do you teach them? But before that, I had a question related to something before, so I don't want to forget. So I'll ask this one first. Feminism has led to a lot of women today unsubscribing from this whole idea of wanting to have kids. Okay? Mm, yeah. I really don't care. Non-Muslim women do you. But this is bleeding into the Ummah now. This is bleeding into the identities of Muslim women who are now, by and large, not most of them, but this number is ever increasing every day, that they're turned off from the idea of wanting to have kids. Where do you think this is stemming from? It's exactly as you said, and it's exactly what I said about if, if somebody asking you about how you would perform the role of the traditional role of a wife and mother, if that makes you feel some kind of way, you need to examine that because that is not coming from fitra. It's not coming from Dean, it's coming from somewhere else. And I, th I think it's coming from the, 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 the general environment that we live in. You know, you could say the gynocentric social order, you can say feminism, you can say whatever it is, end of days, right? But it is definitely something that it, we're being programmed. You know, we're mm -hmm. being programmed. These kids are being programmed all the time. And, you know, subhanAllah, I'm, I'm a Gen, Gen X. So, you know, we grew up without the internet, obviously. We only had smartphones quite late into even our, you know, those that when we had our children and everything. You guys, millennials, you know, zennials, are they calling them? Gen Zs? The amount of the susceptibility to the programming is like times a hundred now. We had Leave It to Beaver on TV, right? We had uh, My Two Dads on TV which was bad enough because I grew up in Africa, right? So when we would watch these American sitcoms and the kids would be saying, shut up to each other, this was like a culture, it was like a culture shock for us. Cause it's like, <gasps> like how are they, you know, you know, when the kid would be like back chatting the parent or they would, you know, shout at the parent saying, that's not my fault, mom, whatever. For us, that was a culture shock. It was like, how are these kids getting, like what's happening, right? Cause that was not our reality. Fast forward to today, that was, TV programs once, two, three times a week. And that was all that was available except for movies. Mm. Now we've got kids on TikTok, on Instagram, on everything all the time, constantly 24 seven, whenever they want to access it, it's there. And it's not just, you know, shut up you idiot. Like it was when I was young. It is, it's, it's everything out there. So again, checking ourselves because what we know is the way to succeed is to be on the Sirat al-Mustaqeem. If you want the best of the dunya and the, without sacrificing your deen, you have to know what that looks like. 
You have to understand what it is that you were created for. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me on this earth? According to him. Not well, according to what I think, or what I feel, what feels good to me. Oh, this is my truth. Oh, this is, this is, this is who I am. Oh, this, you know, all of this stuff. I remember, subhanAllah, there was a, a conference for reverts. And I think it was around the time when a lot of uh, famous hijabi uh, like influencers were taking off the hijabs, right? And then they're making these videos without hijab and they're saying, oh, I realized that I wasn't being true to myself. And, you know, I, you know, I, had, to, I had to be true to myself. And, you know, you guys have always been honest with you. You know, all that stuff. And I said, you know what? You know who's loving this? Shaitan is loving this. Because... The people have been fooled into making their nafs their guide. My truth, this is me, this is how I feel. What is, where does feeling come from? Where do your desires come from? Desires are from nafs. And what have we been taught about the nafs? The nafs, the nafs is not a, a trustworthy guide. The nafs, if you don't control it and discipline it, the nafs is what leads you astray. So we're in a society now where literally nafs is God. If you feel, if it feels good to you, it's all good. If you feel that it's your truth, it's all good. But that's nafs. So we need to be questioning ourselves to say this path that I'm on, how close is it to the sirat al-mustaqim? And is it like going the complete opposite direction? Because if I want to, this dunya is a, is, is, this dunya is a trial, but it's also a beautiful place. I'm sorry, guys. I don't care what anyone says. My belief that I hold, this dunya has good and evil, just like there's opposites and everything. There is so much joy here to be had, so much love, so much connection, so much purpose here on this earth for us to earn Allah's pleasure, right? But mm. you can enjoy it without sacrificing your akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put us in a deen that means that you have no joy, no love, no laughter, no connection. You know, none of the pleasures of the world are for you if you want Jannah. That's not true. It's not true. The handful of things that are haram are bad for us. They're harmful. They hurt us and they hurt other people. But aside from that handful of things that's haram, the dunya is wide and vast. But we're not seeing it. What we are seeing is that handful of things that are haram and we're seeing all the joy and the love and the connection and the fun is all there. That's what I want. I want the handful of haram. I don't care about all the other halal things. I want this haram here. SubhanAllah. Hmm. And SubhanAllah that we live in a time where men, we can't even politely remind women or sisters about hijab. Like it's toxic. Yeah, no? that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. You can't like because society is telling us you can't tell women how to dress, but society is also moving sus. So you know, people just got to realize that. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one, and I think it's it's helpful to remember that the trajectory, the cultural and social trajectory of Muslim women, is not like the socio cultural trajectory of non Muslim Western women. It, the the Non-Muslim non -Muslim Western women have been on this path since the 60s, okay? We can argue that sisters within the Muslim community have only been on this path for the, like, the last 20 years, right? It's nothing like Western women. So we've just come out of a space where women had absolutely no voice, where a panel like this would be impossible, okay? It would not be possible for me to speak like this with you, and that's facts, okay? We just came out, literally, the early 2000s, a time when sisters had no public voice, no space to speak about their issues at all. And a lot of sisters would have been coming out of families where they saw the way that their mothers did the whole traditional role thing. Mm. And they saw the impact it had and they saw the patriarchal norms. And they've literally fresh come out of that. They're not buying it. Western women now are like, we want to go back to traditional roles. A lot of Asian women are like, excuse me, we just came out of that. We're not going back to that. So my hypothesis because I just came out of the 90s and the early 2000s as well. I remember a time, okay, where the brothers were the masculine role models and like the gender roles were, you know, strictly defined and there wasn't any of this kalam you're talking about, not wanting children and stuff like that. There was nothing like that. I remember what that was like. 
And that's why I say we need to stop looking to the recent past. We need to stop looking even to the not so recent past. What we need to be doing is taking our guidance from the Sira and looking forward to say, how can we do this in a healthy way? Because just because you're a masculine man doesn't mean you are a good person. Just because you are a feminine woman does not mean that you have good character. Okay, so just because people are one is out to work and the other is at home does not mean there is love between them, does not mean that they are fully healed from whatever traumas they had, does not mean that they can communicate, doesn't mean that there is, you know, the things that make a happy home. So the gender roles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out, yes, we need to reclaim those, mm -hmm. but we equally need to reclaim our own spiritual, emotional and mental health so that we can be healthy individuals in healthy relationships, raising healthy families. Because the gender roles make no difference if you are a dysfunctional human being. That's, that's facts. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. And there we go. That was, that was just straight facts. Anna had to leave. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> no, no, no. His, uh, his internet does that every now and then, and then he comes back. But yeah, uh, if Rami... If you don't have any questions, I wanted to go on to my next question about the sons. Yeah, go for it, bro. I don't know, bro. Yeah, you good? My bad about that. I was, like, wondering in my head, like, yo, I wonder what time it is. And then the the stream yard just completely, like, shut off. I was, no, I don't know about that. Yeah. So how are you raising your sons in this time of mass fitna? SubhanAllah. You know, having kind of paid attention to the experiences of men and what men talk about amongst themselves and in particular the way that being raised by a single woman impacted them it, it humbles you you know it, it, it's humbling I think that is one of the things that is so difficult maybe for many sisters or women in general to 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 face is this this humbling notion that things are not the way you always thought they were you know, things are not as black and white as you thought. You're not always the good guy. Sometimes you're actually the bad guy. Sometimes you are the problem. Sometimes you yourself as a woman are the originator of the problem. And that's not something that I had necessarily considered. And I don't think as women, we're really encouraged to see what is happening with me that is leading to the outcomes that I'm seeing. It's very easy to blame other people because I'm just a woman, right? And everybody else is responsible for me. It's always somebody else's fault. Um, and anybody who takes issue with this, y'all know I do be talking about, you know, taking responsibility for yourself. And I have been talking about that ever since ever. So this is not a new thing. But what I will say is that I am acutely aware of the fact that, you know, now my children's father passed away, Allah There are certain things that I can't teach them, okay? Because I am not a man. And I'm, I'm a woman, I'm their mother. You know, mothers have certain sensibilities. We have certain tendencies. We are the ones who tend to coddle. We're the ones who tend to make excuses for. We because we want to protect. That's our nurturing instinct, right? Um, and that's why the having the, the father and the mother in the home is so important because they balance each other out, inshallah. Where the mother would make excuses and kind of, you know, like let it, you know, let it lie and say, don't worry, whatever. And, you know, just kind of make it OK. The father will take him to account. The father will pull him up on it. The father will discipline him. Right. Again, generalizations. But anyway, in answer to your question, I'm acutely aware of the fact that my children, by and large, have grown up without their father. And so them learning to be men in this space is something that it's almost a journey they will have to go on on their own. But what I will say is I will I speak to them about how their father was as a husband, uh, how their father was as a father, um, as the leader of the household, you know, what he instilled in us and what he created for us. I need them to know that so they know that they have some kind of model. You know, they have they have a legacy. OK, so that's one thing. But I think of late, the main thing that I've been saying to them is no simping, to be honest. Of course, we talk to them about, you know, staying chaste and respecting themselves and not putting themselves in haram situations and everything that the dean teaches. But aside from what the dean teaches, my boys know my rule is no simping whatsoever. Now, what does no simping mean? For me, my definition of simping 
is when you invest time, energy, and resources in a woman who does not appreciate you or those, those resources, those things that you're bringing, yeah? Uh, so typically, I, what I tell, tell my boys, I said, look, work on yourself, establish yourself as the best version of yourself. Because at that point, you will be able to then choose your life partner from a place of strength, okay? Um, I want you to have your Dean on point, your money on point, you know, your education, your career, your vision on point. Because at that stage, inshallah, you can pick who it is that you want that fits in with your life vision. The other thing that I said to them is that choose a woman who chooses you, not a woman that you have to convince to get onto your program. This whole chasing and convincing and like negotiating, you know, the whole negotiated desire thing. It's the, I think with the Muslims and marriage is not so much a desire thing because you can desire someone and still not commit to them in marriage. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not all about desire for us. But I hope and inshallah, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a woman who considers herself blessed to be with him. She sees that man and she's like, Yes, you know, alhamdulillah, like I, I, this is, he, she is for you, you know, she, she rates you like that. It's so important because if you've got a woman who's meh, she could take it or leave it, but yeah, okay. If you do this, 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 then maybe I'll consider, I'm going to get red pill with y'all and tell you move on. That's not the one for you. Any woman who is making you jump through hoops and hoops and hoops in order for her to commit to you, guess what? After you win her, that's going to be your life. Convincing her, jumping through hoops on her program, going according to what she wants, basically pandering to her and catering and keeping her on that pedestal. Because the minute that you don't, like the minute you bring her down from that pedestal or you don't keep the pedestal high enough, she's going to call you out and say, but you used to do this and you used to do that and now I'm not happy and da da da. So, it sounds really kind of mean, but that is the advice I give to my sons. And one of the reasons why I can't take a woman's side all the time is because I have sons. I don't want my sons marrying some entitled sister who doesn't want to commit to them and is not like all in, you know, she's not, especially, I'm talking about young people here now. Forget about the, the, the second, third marriage people. I'm talking about your first marriage. For me, my experience and what I've seen and what I've learned the best way to start off life is with somebody who is, the, she's on your team, you know? So for my sons, I want you to marry somebody who's on your team. She's got your back. She's ride or die. You don't have to have everything figured out at the beginning, but she has to see the potential in you and be like, I'm, I'm, I'm here for this program, you know? Um, and with my daughter, I say the same thing. I said, if there was a brother who came for you, and I said, what do you think of him? And you said, oh, well, he's okay. Well, I guess if he does this, 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 and if he has this, 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 then maybe I'll consider him. I'll say, brother, this is this. She's not the one for you. Sorry. It's not worth it because that's going to be your life. And if that's your life, that, in my opinion, and from what I've read and from what I've seen, is not the stability that you want for your family. The man has to have frame and he has to maintain frame. And his wife, if we're talking traditional here, his wife needs to be in his frame. She needs to be on his program. They could have discussed the program and have come to the realization that we're on the same program. I love it. I, I fully buy into this. No problem. It could be a co-created program. It could be it was his idea and then she liked it and she hopped on. I don't mind. But you have to be on the Amir's program. Otherwise, he can't be the Amir. Otherwise, there's two Amirs in the house. You, my dear friend, have got your program and you my dear, have got your program and you're constantly at loggerheads about who is winning, who is going to dominate the other one. Again, going back to stability, that's not the way for a stable marriage. And that's why we talk about the man having qawam, the man providing and protecting and leading, right? Ideally, ideally, the woman trusts him. She trusts him to lead. It says, if you want a traditional marriage, you have to choose someone that you can trust to lead. He may not get it right all the time. He probably won't get it right all the time. But that's who you chose. That's who you signed up for. Your role is to trust him and to support him and to be a team, like be a team player. 
you know, uh, and unfortunately, because people have been through things, because the cultural narrative is brothers ain't, sh yeah, uh, and brothers always doing this, and brothers are what clears, and brothers are waste man, and all of this type of thing, that is part of the cultural narrative for us as Muslims now, even though we don't have any data to say that that's the majority. We have no way of knowing whether the majority of Muslim men are simply hardworking, average guys doing the best they can with what they have. We've got no way of knowing whether that's true or not. But we can assume that the worst stories are the ones that everyone knows, that the worst narratives are the ones that keep getting passed around, right? And we can assume that the people who are doing really well tend not to talk about it. Yes mm -hmm. or no? For, yeah, you know, right. some valid reasons. People don't be out here showing off about my husband, you know, he's such a great provider, mashallah, like I feel so safe and secure with him. And you know, you're not seeing that. Those sisters who are happily married, by and large, they don't say anything. The sisters who have bad, bad experiences, they are the ones who are vocal, right? So that means that even culturally amongst Muslims, our picture of Muslim marriages is a negative picture because it's dominated by a particular narrative. And again, we don't have data to say whether that is a fair portrayal or not. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah, there's so much more I want to talk about, like uh, Khaira and, you know, the youth men and, you know, modesty and all this, but I say we save it for next time. Cool. Inshallah. Yeah. All right, so... I got to say, bro, yeah, this, on, bro, this has been the conversation that I did not know I needed. And subhanAllah, it's crazy, isn't it? How like we talk to people and, you know, what they're saying 100% might not be what we need, but Allah like speaks through them, uses them as like a, a tool. And it's like, all right, you're going to say this specifically at this point in this day, at this time, and this little thing right here is going to reach this person. That's going to create the tipping point for them and cause them to change this, this and that. It's crazy, subhanAllah. You know, brother, if, you, if I can just say something, inshallah, before we wrap up, and this is, yeah. a, you know, a message to anybody who hears this conversation and feels triggered or feels some kind of way about what I've said. The reality is, brother, sister, you can do whatever you want. Fact. It's a free country. It's a free world. You can do whatever you want and you can make any choice you please. At the end of the day, till akhir, you only answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But understand that the world has rules and every choice has a consequence. Everything that you decide to do, there is a price to pay. So my main thing is get really clear on the things that you're choosing and the price that you're paying for those things. And if you can say with your full chest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is my choice, no one's here to shame to blame, to guilt you into anything, to do like, you know, emotional manipulation. I don't, I don't believe in that because everybody must, must live an authentic life and a sincere life. But just understand that the choices you make have consequences and you will never be able to escape those consequences. So just get clear on that, you know? And if you say, for example, like we're saying, if you say that you want to be a wife, like just get real with it. Do I really want to be a wife though? And if you don't, it's fadali. But then we don't want to see TikToks of you crying like we're seeing with these crazy women at the moment. I don't understand what is up with all of these late 30s, 40s women making TikToks, crying about how they can't find a man and how there's no man and these men ain't this and these men ain't that. Why are you making these TikToks? Why, why are you doing this? Like, it's, it's a, this cultural phenomenon of people oversharing on social media every single aspect of their lives. And if you want to end up like that, the footsteps are clear. The roadmap is there. It's our daddy. Go ahead. But I don't think most of us want to end up like that. I think most of us hope that we can get away with as much as we can get away with and hope that we can have it all. And what I want to say as somebody who, alhamdulillah, has been in this ummah for a lot, you know, fairly long time, I've seen a lot, and I think that we were lied to. I think we were lied to. I think women in this world were lied to when they were told, you can have it all. There's no such thing. There's always a price to pay, and there's always going to be, something has to give. So if you want the career, 
and you want a PhD and you want to be a boss babe and you want to have all of those things, it's your choice. It's your life. But just be aware that there are women who came before you who were told the same thing and you can find them on TikTok crying about the fact that it's not true. And they thought that at 35 and 38, they would find a nice 38 year old man, a 40, ma 40 year old man to marry them and have a family and all of that kind of thing. Cause they still wanted that. And then they find that, oh, there's no men because all the men married earlier or they married younger than them and they can still do that. I don't want our sisters to, to get fooled like they got fooled. I want us to, to be smarter than that so that we don't end up giving up something that maybe was actually really important to you because you thought you could have it all. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. And Rami Anho, if you two brothers have anything to say, let it be known now. Uh, Anho, you want to go first, man? Said everything, though. It's, it's everything. been real, though, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, I got I to gotta admit, look yeah. forward to having you here. Again. Inshallah. Rami, go on. Yes, Panala. So, I mean, all it's, it's there's so much to be said on it, but I, I still do think the root cause of everything is is the Western mentality, Western propaganda. It's the same reason why most people in the West, most people look at Islam as a negative thing. Hmm. It's 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 because that's what's being propagated. And as people who live here, it's being yeah. propagated towards us. And if you think you're not susceptible and you're not going to believe it, well, I mean, look around you. You know, you live the same life as everybody else. And if you're not someone who's actively learning your deen, then you're not someone who's actively straying away from the, you know, anything that opposes it. So, subhanAllah, I have a problem with modernity, with, with presentism, yeah. with being in the present moment, in the present place. There's a reason, that, and this is the same thing, presentism is what caused, you know, Westerners to go to uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and the Middle East and destroy them. They're not like us. They don't have what we have. They don't have democracy. We need to give yeah. them. And this, this is what caused the, the, the division in our ummah to begin with. Now, we can't allow this to continue the divide. We can't allow this mentality to, to continue the dichotomy, the division between us as Muslims, as, as men and women. And yeah. what we need to do as individuals, and something I, I want to agree with Sister um, Naima on, is that marriage doesn't start with finding the right person. It doesn't. Marriage starts with being the best version of yourself. And what did the Prophet والسلام, say? He said um, that, you know, a man would get married or a woman would get married for wealth, status, beauty, and uh, wealth, or wealth, status, beauty, lineage, so on and so forth, things like that. But if you want to be successful, marry for the deen, right? In the mm -hmm. Prophet he said that when you, when you marry, look for good character and good deen. So although these are things we should prioritize, right? And these are things we should prioritize 100%. It doesn't, it, the Prophet ﷺ, he still recognized everything else. Yeah. Wealth, study, status, mm -hmm. all of that. They matter. And, and although there's an objective, there is some kind of objective standard, it doesn't mean pure, personal preferences, you know, don't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, Allah could be said in this panel. I want to leave it there. Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair. Going on, alhamdulillah, it's been a very, very good discussion. We uh, look forward to having you again soon, inshallah. Thank you. Yeah, I just Thank want to give a quick reminder, guys and girls, that ihsan, excellence, is something that we should strive for in everything we do. Um, the solution to corruption for men, it's not black pill. And the solution to this corruption for women, it's not feminism, it's Islam. When there's no Islam, you don't do the opposite of no Islam. You you bring in Islam, you bring in more Islam. And Sister Naima, for... for Anyone that needs to contact you, I don't know if you do one-on-one -on -one sessions or you do any boot camps, like where can they find more of you? Uh, I'm on, uh, I'm at Naima B. Robert on all platforms. Instagram is my favorite. Uh, and I am putting together a podcast with some amazing guests, literally about love and marriage and discussing all of these things, inshallah, for my YouTube. So I hope to be able inshallah. to invite you guys to that very soon. Bismillah. Inshallah. All right, guys, links for all of those in the description, which I'll get with her on WhatsApp later. All right, Rami, do your thing. All right, Taib, and with that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Say bismillah, bro. What are you doing? Bro, it's in my head, man. It's tough. Hey, I like that. I like that. I think there's another thing, too. It's, it's the perseverance aspect, too. Like, we're more willing to stick through with things that we set out with an intention. It's impossible to have empathy for others if you're not patient. So may Allah bless you for that. First of all, I'm going to agree with the fact that the whole thing you said about friends, where it's like if, if they're affecting you more than you're affecting them, then you should probably get some new friends. You want to be investing. 
stocks, shares, bonds, you want to be investing in crypto because there's this thing called inflation, which means every year that passes by, the value of a dollar goes lower and lower and lower. And the reason being is because they're printing more money, right? That's why money is haram. At least the paper money is haram. Provided that you're actually there and you're being a good father and the mother's being a good mother, best conditions. And behind the mic, Hamza Andreas Zortzis, we will go in with our final three with brother Anhel, inshallah. Inshallah, bismillah rahman rahim It's not just a responsibility on you, it's a responsibility on all the children, especially your father. In our private area is very elastic. And yeah, if you go too fast, the skin will literally crease up into like the edge of like the little clipper things and you will literally clip your skin. You don't want to be on YouTube or the internet or anything that that amount of time. But it's, it's the, the fact is that's what we're doing.